Senator Ted Cruz, great to have you here. It's great to be with you, Megan, and congrats on the new podcast. Thank you so much. You know, you were the very first guest on The Kelly File, which turned out to be a very good omen for me. And so here you are, my very first week on The Megan Kelly Show. So I, I'm feeling good. It's an honor. Well, I remember I remember well, and, and you took off like a phenom on, on Fox, and I, I'm sure you will in the, in the podcast world, too. Now, the question for you is whether Donald Trump or Joe Biden took off like a phenom at the debate this week. What would you what would you grade <laughs> each one of those guys? Oh, look, I think the the, the whole thing was a, a mess. Um, I mean, they were yelling at each other. They were interrupting each other. They were insulting each other. I, I thought that got a bit much on both sides. Um, at the end of the day, I doubt the debate changed a whole lot. I, I, I think if you entered the evening supporting Trump, you left the evening still supporting Trump. And, and if you entered supporting Biden, you probably left supporting Biden. Did you feel like Trump did well? I thought he had some good moments. Uh, I, I thought the best moment that, that Trump had was the contrast when he said, Joe Biden wants to shut down the economy, shut down small businesses, take away your job, shut down the schools. I want to see the economy open. I want, I want small businesses open. I want people to go back to work. I want kids to go back to schools. And, and this is a choice between which path America goes. I thought that was a, a, a clear and important contrast and, and, and Trump's best moment of the night. What did you make of all the interrupting? Because people may not know that you're you're a, I mean, you're a storied debater. You've you've argued in front of the U.S. Supreme Court nine times. You've had 43 oral arguments at courts of appeal across the country, not to mention all your years as a U.S. senator. So you've definitely got thoughts on how one debates uh, well. What did you make of it? You know, I thought it was excessive. I, I would have rather had a, a, a more reasoned conversation rather than just yelling at each other. Um, I, I also think several times Trump actually bailed Joe Biden out that, that that rather than letting him answer, he'd interrupt with something else. And I think I, I, I think Biden would have been in more trouble had he just spoken more. I also think Chris Wallace did a very poor job moderating, and you've you've obviously moderated those before, and you you've sat next to Chris doing it, and and it, uh, I, I I think Chris d did not follow the the lines of impartiality. I think he stepped in repeatedly to bail Joe Biden out in in, in a way that I thought was was very inappropriate. Wait, I'll I'll get to that in one sec, but I want to I want to know you know. As you're as you're watching the debate go down and the interruptions are happening, do you are you thinking, how would I have handled this if I were Joe Biden? Because you've been you've debated debated Trump many times. What would you have done if yep. you'd been on the receiving end of that? Oh, look, I, I think Biden handled some of that pretty well. Um, I, Biden's biggest victory of the night was probably that that for the expectations for him were so low mm -hmm. that 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 he was able to give give coherent answers and lay out his positions and and I had been raising a caution flag for some time that I think uh, conservatives convince themselves that that Biden has full on dementia and that that he can't operate a remote control mm -hmm. um I, I think that's that that's exaggerated I think Joe has has lost a step but but he uh, you know, was able to articulate what he believes and he did did fine. And that that was probably beneficial for Joe. It was also helpful for him uh, to at least purport to run away from some of the more radical positions of his party. So when mm -hmm. he when Joe said he didn't support defunding the police, um, that was probably good for him to say. Now, I, I think Wallace and or Trump both should have pressed back on him and said, well, wait a second here. Uh, your party certainly does. The NYPD does when cutting a billion dollars. The Austin Police Department does. Portland does. Minneapolis does. Um, and we're seeing the results. I, I think there should have been a lot more pushback. But Biden at, at least tried to run away from the more extreme and more unpopular positions right, in that his party. And the Green New Deal. And he wouldn't comment on whether he's going to pack the U.S. Supreme Court if he gets in office. Uh, but you raise a good point because I guarantee you, I guarantee you, Chris Wallace had follow ups 
to all of those. There's no way he wouldn't have had that in his outline. But he didn't get to ask any of them because the clock the clock kept ticking. Trump kept interrupting. It would spin out of control. And as the moderator, I mean, I could I could almost feel his panic, like the outline's gone. The debate's gone. And I'll I'll defend him in this conversation just by saying sometimes when you're panicking over the time that's that's ticking away, you try to do a fast wrap of the topic. And I think Chris kind of gave it to Biden many times over the course of that hour and a half in an attempt to move on and maybe didn't realize that he was leaning a little bit more toward the one candidate than the other. Yeah, I, look, I, I understand that. And this was an incredibly difficult debate for anyone to moderate. I mean, tr- Trump is a force of nature and and uh, not a traditional debater, to put it mildly. <laughs> um, you know, I think Chris snickered and laughed and, and had some smart alecky comments that I think it's perfectly clear that, that Chris is voting for Joe Biden and not Donald Trump. And I, and I think that came out in the debate. And that is not a good thing for someone who's moderating a general election debate. It, it the questions he, he, he was willing to ask the questions that are the oppo dump on Trump. And, and he didn't have the same willingness to do that to Biden. And, and I think that's and, and actually something I suggested today. I, I'd like to see how debates are done uh reformat it in, that. in that so what do you what do you want to have happen look i think there is a a pretense of objectivity but i think in republican primaries many of the people who are moderating the debate are themselves liberal democrats who want well, everyone on the stage to lose most, many right? I, yeah, if you yeah look I, at most the political yes. affiliations sure. of journalists um and in the general election uh, most of the people who who moderate are are also Democrats themselves. Um, you know, this, the next debate, uh, Scully was literally an intern for Joe Biden and an intern for Ted Kennedy. I mean, that's pretty remarkable. I didn't know that. Um, the guy moderating the it, next debate was an intern for Joe Biden. Yes, I didn't. Know <laughs> I mean, that. it's pretty wow. stunning. Wow. Um, and and look, people can have political backgrounds and 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 be in journalism, but but what I would suggest is is sort of drop the pretense. So I suggested two common sense rules going forward, which is number one, in a Republican primary debate, the moderators should be people who actually will vote in a Republican primary. Um, and, and that, I think that makes people more likely to ask the kinds of questions a Republican primary voter would care about rather than in the Repub- primary Republican primary debate, you have some, you, um, you know, you, you may remember one of the debates where, you know, John Harwood was insulting everyone in the in the primary debate. And I kind of went off on him on it. it there was no doubt he was going to vote for the Democrat and he wanted mm-hmm. all of us to lose. And, and mm-hmm. so I think that's a strange way to do a primary debate. And then what I suggested for the general election is rather than. Rather than have sort of fake impartiality, just own the bias and have one outspoken conservative and one outspoken liberal. So I suggested a couple of pairings. I said, you know, look, uh, Mark Levin and Chris, Chris Hayes, everyone knows, or, or Rush Limbaugh and Rachel Maddow, um, or Ben <laughs> oh Shapiro my, and, and, my and Chris Cuomo. <laughs> All right. Well, now I but, object you know, the to point on this. that. It, no, I get it. I, I, I get it. it. it Just it, be open about the bias. But if I object to these rules, number one, because they would exclude me in any way, shape or form, because I'm a registered independent <laughs> and I think I know how to I, do a good debate. A, a, a fair point, and 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 I actually agree. You don't fall neatly into if you were sort of openly owning the bias that that might leave you out. So sorry, yeah. <laughs> sorry I, about that. I object to all of that, and you know most of the journalists will tell you, oh, you know, I'm 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 independent or I'm I'm nonpartisan, and they really are. I'm actually not. I've been a registered Dem. I've been a registered Republican. I've been a registered Independent for the past decade plus. But you know, I I vote the I guess man or woman, not the party. You know, most most politicians present company accepted, irritate me. And it's hard for me to feel real affinity for them. <laughs> but maybe well, look, I mean, alone. I can I can say candidly from having done several debates with you moderating that that you you don't have the contempt for the Republican field that a lot of the other moderators did. And, mm-hmm. and, it, and it came across uh, it came across in the questions and the approach 
um, which is not. And by the way, the, those journalists are great for a Democratic primary. I mean, they actually reflect the, the Democratic primary voters priorities because that's how they're, they personally feel. But the, the questions many of the primary debates have are, are not questions that actual Republican voters are, care about. OK, but let me let and, me ask you one thing on that. I, I agree that the, the Republicans are trying to figure out during their primary who represents my view, who do I most want to see yeah. representing my party in the general. But the other piece of it is who can win? You know, and I remember at that debate, right. you know, the now the now infamous debate w- with Trump and my question to him about the women. Um, one of the things I was asking Scott Walker about was whether he was too extreme on the on the abortion issue, right? Because ev- most mm-hmm. of the Republicans are just fine with somebody who's pro-life. You kind of have to be pro-life if you want to win as a GOP presidential candidate. Um, but I was pressing. I just chose to press him on whether that was going to be too extreme because he doesn't want any exceptions for the life or health of the mother and the Democrats would go insane to win in a general. So don't you think, you know, there, there's some value in, in having some representation of what's important to the left and whether you can overcome it to get enough people in the center to win? So, of course there is. But but I actually think primary voters know that. I mean, you get that question all the time. OK, who's who's best position to win? And and so th- that's if you look in the Democratic primary. I mean, that's the main reason Joe Biden ended up winning the nomination is because yes. they had a very explicit conversation where most of their party was with Elizabeth Warren and was with the far left and with Bernie. But at the end of the day, Joe Biden convinced them in their primary that he had a better shot of winning. And so they had a very explicit conversation, but it wasn't a conversation. I mean, I- imagine a Democratic primary debate this cycle moderated by Rush Limbaugh. I mean, I mean, that would be kind of absurd, wouldn't it? But I mean, who wouldn't I mean, tune it's in obvious. for that? <laughs> it, it'd be interesting. But, yeah. and, my, and my point is that that it, it's all one sided, that that for a primary debate, you shouldn't have people moderating it who want everyone on the on the stage to lose. You should actually have people moderating it who are saying, look, I one of these guys, I hope wins. And then in the general Look, if we, if you were doing a debate, let's say with with Mark Levin and, and Chris Hayes, you'd get hard questions. Both sides would get hard questions. I mean, I try to pick people who are smart, serious. I'm going to say, uh, you know, I just you did do that, and you add somebody, you add a news person in the center who can, I, I, and, and I could it. live with that too. I, I th- could, that I could, would be. I, I think we've struck a deal. I think we have it. We have it all, all set right. for when you run in 2024 which I'll get to in a minute. Um, but let's talk about the Supreme Court because that's the hottest issue of the day and you're the perfect person to ask about it. Let's start broad. Do you think Amy Coney Barrett is going to be confirmed and by when? Uh, I do. I, I feel very good about it. Um, I, I think she will be confirmed. Obviously, the the hearings start in judiciary on October 12th. Uh, and I think we will confirm her by by the end of the month. I think it will, she'll, she'll be confirmed before Election Day, which I think is is really important to ensure we have a, a full functioning nine justice Supreme Court uh, there it, it, uh, in case there are any election disputes that come out. Of you it. don't think there are any meaningful, effective tactics the Democrats can do to stop it? I don't. Uh, and I hope there aren't. Um, now, I mean, I, I'll admit we've been sitting and brainstorming with with creative parliamentary export experts about everything. I think they'll try everything they can and, and they may try some, some extraordinary things. Um, uh, you know, they may try storming out and boycotting. I, I think at the end of the day, that is, is pretty limited. Or what if, uh, what they if might there's, try... a, there's suddenly someone that's not exactly this way, but like a Christine Blasey Ford, who suddenly comes out to die fi with a hideous allegation against uh, Judge Barrett. Well, I think I think they will try that if they can find anything. So I uh, sat down with with Judge Barrett this week and and spent about forty five minutes with her in the Capitol, and I think she's she's very impressive. Her credentials are very strong, but I was really impressed with her temperament. I think her temperament is very calm. It's it's scholarly. It's a judicial temperament, and and you know I t- I told her I said, listen, right now they're trying to find someone. Uh, who, who went to third grade with you, who hates your guts. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I don't know what's going to drop out of nowhere. Um, 
look, I have in particular feel feel for her because she's got seven kids and, and we've seen a couple of Democratic operatives begin by attacking the kids and attacking that the two of the children were adopted from Haiti. It's and, and I just think kids should be off limits. I mean, I, I mean, and, it's, and I think that's despicable. It's not only did we see Democratic operatives do it, but like there was one woman who worked for both Democratic con- congressional offices and campaigns. She's tweeting about how she'd love to know which adoption agency uh, Judge Barrett got her children from yeah. um, and suggesting something untoward happened. And then even Ibram X. Kendi, the author of How to, how to Be an Anti-Racist, Boston University yep. professor, how apropos of nothing, oh, it just had nothing to do with her, although it happened right after she was announced, tweets out, some white colonizers adopted, in quotes, black children. They, quote, civilized these, quote, savage children in the, quote, superior ways of white people while using them as props in their lifelong pictures of denial, while cutting the biological parents of these children out of the picture of humanity. And whether this is Barrett or not is not the point. It's a belief too many white people have. If they have or adopt a child of color, then they can't be racist. Th- that didn't have anything to do with Barrett, even though she's mentioned. Nothing to do with her. I, I mean, it's, I, I think it's twisted. And and when I visited her, I was, it was like, how are the kids? And, and you know, look, this is something I've, I've seen firsthand ha- having run for office. As you know, our girls now, you've known them since they were little, but our girls now are, are nine and 12. I, I remember on the 2016 presidential campaign when when the Washington Post did an editorial cartoon of Heidi's and my daughters where they drew them as dancing monkeys. Mm-hmm. And the girls were, I think, five and seven at the time. And, and wow. Heidi and I had to sit down and tell them, OK, so there's this cartoon that was done of you. And it's and I remember Catherine was just like, why? Why would they draw me as a monkey? And I was like, well, Sometimes people are mean and they get angry, but it's OK. And, and it, it was not. And so I actually told 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 Amy about that. And I said, look, I've been in the position of trying to explain to young kids why someone would draw them in into this kind of fight. And so I do. I hope that we don't see the hearings go that way. I hope I hope that 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 some some bit of decency holds the attack back. Absolutely. But, but who knows? And we're already seeing it, you know, people attacking her Catholicism. I mean, Bill Maher came out and called her an effing nutcase, uh, talking yeah. about how how Catholic she is. And I know the Democrats are like, well, Nancy Pelosi is Catholic, too, and Sotomayor. But th- they it is being made an issue of suggesting that The Handmaid's Tale was written based on some sect that she's anyway. There's a lot already and it's going to be ugly. Yeah. Um, qu- question. Some of the Democrats are saying she should recuse herself if we go through an election nightmare and the case has to go up to the Supreme Court and she's on it, that she has an obligation to recuse herself from deciding it. Your thoughts on that? So so I think that's an absurd claim. I expect them actually to press it at the hearings. And it, and it was certainly a, it's certainly a talking point that you're seeing pushed. Um, one of the biggest reasons why it's important for us to confirm uh, her to the court it is that this election in particular, I think there's a very significant likelihood that it's contested. It's close. Um, I think either side that loses, uh, there's a real chance they'll file litigation challenging it. As, as you know, I was part of the legal team in, in Bush versus Gore. This is one mm-hmm. of the things I talk about in my book, One Vote Away. Um, each chapter in the book focuses on a different constitutional right, and it talks about major landmark cases uh, before the Supreme Court that I helped litigate and, and Bush versus Gore. Um, you know, I was a young lawyer in the George W. Bush campaign. That's actually where, where Heidi and I met. We were in cubicles right down the hall from each other. And, uh, in that election, as, as you remember, well, uh, on election night, uh, George W. Bush won and he was declared the winner, but then it became the, the margin was very close. And so Al Gore, challenged it, brought in lawyers and filed lawsuits to challenge it. And, and I was in Tallahassee, was in Florida for, for that entire time. And it was, it was complete chaos. You know, I, I write in the book about how like we, we had a war room with a whiteboard on the wall and, and there were seven different lawsuits that were pending simultaneously, mm-hmm. any one of which could, could cost the presidency of the United States and, and the stakes, the, and twice that case went to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, the first time we won unanimously, nine to nothing, where the Supreme Court said the Florida Supreme Court, which was a partisan Democratic court, had gotten it wrong. 
Um, the second time it went to the Supreme Court on, on the question of remedy, the court uh, divided 5-4 and, and, and the court held that the ballots had been counted four times. Bush had won all four and that enough was enough, that, that, that they couldn't keep challenging it over and over and over again and, and ended it. It was 36 days of, of complete chaos where the country and the world didn't know who the next president was going to be. And it's going to be I harder think this if year, eight justices. And if they're eight, if the court is divided 4-4, they don't have the authority to decide anything. And and what, what could happen? make it even so? What makes it really crazy is is in Florida you just had one jurisdiction where it was being challenged. I think there's a real possibility. Let's say Biden, if he were to lose, I think Biden could file lawsuits in three or four or five states, and so you could have say the Ninth Circuit deciding a case out of Arizona, and the Eleventh Circuit deciding a case out of Florida. Now, normally, a federal court of appe- courts of appeals conflict. You go to the Supreme Court to resolve it. If the Supreme Court were divided 4-4, nobody knows what would happen. You just have conflicting decisions and a constitutional crisis. And mm, Joe Biden would start appointing three extra judges from <laughs> from his home in Delaware. <laughs> That's, it, it, it's gotten it, it so would, crazy, it'd be Senator, nuts. with with the the. It's going to be nuts either way if if Trump challenges too. If he loses, either way, we, we might sure. be headed for a massive I, massive legal battle. And the and, and an important point, Megan, on the, the recusal. So so I had a number of reporters asked me on the recusal and I, and I asked them, I said, well, do, do you think that that Elena Kagan and Sonia Sotomayor should recuse themselves because they were appointed in the Obama Biden administration? And the answer, right. by the way, is, of course not, that that every justice was appointed by a president and confirmed by a Senate and justices routinely have to rule on cases that involve the president and administration that appointed them. That that's that's part of the job. And and it is important to underscore, look, I don't want to see any justice confirmed because that justice would rule for whatever candidate I happen to support. That's not a Supreme Court justice's job. What I want to see is a justice that will ensure that the law is followed, that if there's litigation and uncertainty, we should follow federal law and follow the Constitution. And I and that means whoever actually won the election uh, should should be the winner, and, and and we should have a functioning Supreme Court that can ensure we're following the law and and have have a clear clear forum to resolve those disputes.